Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I'm very happy to welcome back our friend John Barclay. Hey John. Hello Nicole, happy to be back. Thanks for having me. Yes, John is here to present his ongoing series, Crafting Your Images with Topaz. John is an award-winning freelance photographer based out of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. He's a passionate photographer and enthusiastic workshop leader, leading workshops and tours around the world. He is also our first guest presenter as far as our webinar series here at Topaz, so we're always happy to have him back. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. I guess I didn't realize that. So I was number one in the guest presenters. Yes, you were. <laughs> wow, it like forever ago. Okay, I need to hit show my screen, I think. <laughs> All right, you confirm to me that you see my screen. Yes, we see it. Good, excellent. I always like that. It's always helpful if you can see my screen before I get started. Uh, thanks for having me back, Nicole. It is good to be back. I enjoy Topaz and my friends at Topaz and the opportunity to share. Today, we're going to do things a little differently. Um, I had some feedback at last time that maybe I was trying to cram in a little bit too much information. So I'm going to slow down a little and, um, and see if we can't cover some a little bit more intermediate to advanced techniques, I guess, uh, to, to help you see how I use the Topaz plugins a little more uh, creatively and not just maybe as one uh, you know, sledgehammer, right, with that look and that effect that you can, with with Photoshop, with layers and masking, you can now blend these things in, you can use an opacity slider, we'll talk about that, uh, how to use a layer mask, we'll talk about that. And so just a side note on that as it relates to that. I recognize not everybody has Photoshop. Uh, a lot of you have Lightroom or might even have Elements. So Elements does have layers and masking capabilities. Certainly Photoshop does. So still stay tuned even though you might be using or not using rather Photoshop or Elements because it may convince you that there's a real reason to think about it. And now with the $9.95 a month from Adobe to get Lightroom and Photoshop, it becomes a lot more affordable for everybody to have that solution. And be aware that on with the, both Glow, which was just announced, which we'll touch base on a little bit here, and then Impression, they do not have the masking module yet, but I've been assured that they will have in the next couple of months. So the masking module will become part of that, and then that gives you the ability right from with the Topaz products to take in or leave out, or take out rather, or leave behind the effect that you're doing. So today, to try to get things to move along a little faster as far as what we can cover, I've gone ahead and brought this image into Photoshop right away so we can get started on it. And I've created a duplicate layer over here on the right side. That's a common thing for me to do because if I'm going to use black and white effects, which I will here, to give me an effect, I might want the ability to blend that layer with the background layer, and we'll talk about that, or to use a layer mask and so forth. So that's what's going to take a little bit of time on this image to get through that, uh, but I think it's really worthwhile. It's what I use a lot. It's, it's what, to me, separates kind of the average um, amateur photographer maybe you know, going to the next level, something that has the ability to understand layers and layer masks and it really can help you craft, uh, seriously craft your image to the next level. So let's, let's go here and get into Topaz and let's go to black and white effects too. Always take some minutes on a big file. Okay. So I'm going to go to the bottom right. I always like to start clean and hit the reset button. And this is what we see in the interface again. And I've covered this, but I never know who I have that might be new or not. So I always err on the side of making sure to teach to those who might not know and new. On the left side, we have all these wonderful presets, which Nicole has spent a lot of time and others there, but mostly Nicole creating these wonderful looks that you can click a button, which is a tremendous place to start. Uh, however, the more you know about the right side of the interface, the better. I've talked about the right side of the interface before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that other than to point out some possible choices for you because I really want to talk about the layers and the maskings. But here's a great way to look at what all of these uh, collections, if you will, here. These are effects and they're in the collections. If you click on this um, 
it looks like uh, what, nine squares together, and you'll have a grid. It looks like a grid. If you click on that, it'll give you a much bigger preview of the possibilities of what might be in that particular collection. It's a great way to look through and find something that might be appealing to you. I kind of like this warm tone, so if I double click on that, there we have it, it's applied. And all that's doing is affecting the sliders over here on the right. And how do you know which sliders are being affected? Well, if there's a check in the checkbox, you'll know that that particular uh, portion of the program is being used. And I can roll this open and see that this amount of contrast and just a little bit of boost black. That's all that's been done in that particular one. Adaptive exposure has been used a little bit and so forth. But you should be aware that you can take any preset, and you should be uh, looking to do this, and alter it to your taste. I mean, that preset was made on, on an image that is not like yours, and so it's going to be different. Uh, so don't be afraid to come over here and even do things like, I wonder what a different filter choice will give me. And I'm up on the filters on the top right side, and it gives me a very different look depending on which filter I, I click as to how it renders his face or the background of the hat. And if you've got to go all the way back, I'm going to go back to this one tool on the border because that's what I want to use here. Okay. So just to kind of show again the idea here, and the adaptive exposure, one of the things I, that everybody should love, and I definitely love about the Topaz products, is the adaptive exposure regions. This is the same that's what's made them famous, which is the Topaz Adjust. That's built right into the black and white. Um, plug-in. And this allows you to remember what this does is if you think about the adaptive exposure, it's like an auto-adjust, but, but it goes from 1 to 100. And then the region says how much of the tonalities do you want to be affected. So the further this slide, whoops, I'm sorry, pull the slide, the further this is to the left, the fewer. So it's, it's affecting the bright brights and the dark darks. The further I pull it to the right, the more tonalities that are going to be affected throughout that image until you're all the way over here and every single tonality in the image will be affected by this adaptive exposure. So once again, they, they had it, the preset was somewhere down here and somewhere down around 21. I'm just going to touch that up just a little bit to 30 because I like what that does and add this over here a little bit. So it's a slight adjustment, but that's the point. The point is you want to be mindful of crafting this to be what you want it to be. And if I've selected a preset that has a border and I really don't want a border, not a problem. Go to the finishing touches because the border is a finishing touch and you'll see again a checkbox that means that particular portion of the plugin is being used and we can change the, the, uh, the border if we want to make it white or grungy, we can do that. If we simply uncheck that, that border will go away which is what I want to do. Okay, last thing, just as far as the black and white portion of the program goes, is something that I've spoken about a couple of times, but it's one of my absolute favorite things to do, and it's something unique, I think, still to, to Topaz, is this transparency. And again, this is found in the finishing touches on the right side. And if we tick that box for transparency and then roll that open, Let's see what can happen in this particular photograph. It's fantastic. I adore this look. So as we pull this over, what it's doing is it's bringing the, uh, back some of the color. And what's interesting is it never brings all of the color. If you push it all the way over to one, which I have, which is as far as you can affect it, it really gives it a faded old-time photograph look. So even though I'm using the black and white effects, I can certainly get a great black and white effect and turn that transparency off. But if I want to get this old time photograph look, I can choose how much of that, uh, the transparency, or how much I want to reveal of the underlying color photograph. I really like that for this particular image. So we're going to go ahead and accept that. And just as a simple review, so click on these grids and that'll show you in nice big previews how to see what's in that collection or you can click on them over here and roll over them and see them that way. And then don't be afraid to play with the filters here, with the different uh, 
capabilities. It, it's very robust. There's a lot you can do to affect the conversion of this in black and white. Don't be afraid to play with those sliders and see what they do uh, and alter them to taste. So let's go ahead and accept that. Well, this is where we'll start to get fun because what we're going to do next, so so the, the value over here now in, in trying to add a little more information here is I now have a layer. If I unclick the eyeball on that layer, I see the, the photograph behind. And just to prove to you that, that that look that we just created, I can't bring it back to look like it did originally, right? That's what it looks like with the transparency at 100. This is what the original photograph looked like. It's a, it's a dramatic difference. Okay, so that's not bad. That's pretty darn good, actually. I like that, and that would be one right answer for a good processing choice. But what can we do maybe in this case to, to make it a more affected or more painterly type look? And I'm going to do something known as the claw because I want to keep the, uh, the effect that I've made, and that is with the black and white effects. And if you hold down the shift option command E, it makes what's called a stamped layer. So now I have layer two, which includes everything that was left behind but allows me to work on this layer. That Don't worry about it. If that sounds complicated, don't worry about it at this moment. If that, that's not as important in this discussion. You'll see what becomes very important here in a minute. Let's go and, and go into impression. Okay. So impression, we better make this the right size. There we go. Impression on the right side, we have the featured choices as far as um, what they think you might want to look at. But then we can roll open up here and see the different, again, categories of painterly effects. And I'm a fan of the painting ones for people. And again, it's going to take a little while to get those to load. Um, but things like, let's see what happens if we just click this, um, Degas Dancers, number one. Isn't that wonderful? Let's, let's uh, click on this as a before, before, after. It's a wonderful painterly look. Um, maybe let's look at a couple others just to, to give you an idea. Uh, oil paint is always good, and there's various ones of oil paint. Uh, let's just go to this one here. Give it a second. And you have that look. And then there's uh, painterly, and I think that's where we'll end up here. If we go to painterly 2, we have a slightly different, maybe a little more realistic look. Let's hit before. So there's the, the image that came out of black and white effects. And here's what the painterly uh, effect. Now, same thing on the right side, you'll see these uh, sliders in the middle of the choice that I'm making. So right on painterly two, which is highlighted in blue, that's how we know which one I'm using. If I click on those sliders, now I have the ability to further uh, tweak this particular look should I want to. And I can, I can change the brush size and make it a different brush, which will have a different effect. Um, I can change the amount of the paint volume, and that will start to make it look, you can almost see the brush strokes now show, showing through uh, with the paint volume. You can change the paint opacity, uh, the stroke rotation, and that will change the way the brushes uh, appear. Um, you can see how it looks much more effective in brush. So suffice it to say, there's a lot going on here that you can play with beyond the preset again that's given to you. Again, in the essence of time and trying to focus on how we use these a little more creatively, let's go ahead and accept this and send this back into Photoshop. Okay, so if I if I untick both of these, we'll kind of see what's happened. So here's, and again, I'm over on the right side of the screen is where I'm showing you the layers and what's happening there. So the first layer was the black and white effects. And now this layer added on top of it is now showing you what the painterly look is. But for me, the eyes and the mouth need to be sharp. I, I want them to be sharper than what this painting is doing. So, so what do I do? What are my choices to do that? And how about if I didn't want this to be so um, 
strong as far as the effect. How can I blend this particular effect back with the underlying layer? So, so let's talk about that one first. There's a relationship happening between layer two and layer one. And that relationship is controlled or can be controlled by a couple of different things, namely this opacity slider right here. So this opacity slider is going to affect how much of the layers below it we come through. So if I pull this all the way over to zero, all that we're seeing is the net effect of layer one. We're seeing the black and white effects only. But as I pull this opacity slider, we're seeing 20% of the impressions or 30% or 60% all the way up until 100%. So if I didn't want this look to be so heavy handed and I wanted to, to look more uh, photorealistic, I could simply drag this down to something like 60%. And now if here's the before with just the black and white. And if I turn that layer back on, it's much more subtle and gentle, right? So that's one way we can control the relationship between the layers is to affect the opacity. I'm going to bring this up just so we can see what's going on here. But what about if I, what, I really like this look, but I really just wanted to mask the eyes or the mouth and maybe the mustache so there's some sharpness there. Well, I need to add what's called a layer mask. And I can find that layer mask by looking down at the bottom right of the screen and clicking on what I like to refer to as the front end loading washing machine. That's this one. If I hover over, it'll eventually say add a layer mask. Well, there's my mask. What you need to understand about a mask is in order for it to be active, it has to have brackets around it. So the brackets are there. For instance, if I had it here, the brackets were around the picture, you're going to have all sorts of troubles and you're going to be cussing at me because it's not working right. So just know that if it's not doing what it's intended to, it's probably because you don't have the mask active. Click on the mask, make sure that, but just by simply clicking in the white, I make it active and I can see those brackets around it. It's white because white re, uh, um, reveals. So white is revealing everything of the Topaz impression that I did. But what we need to know is if I paint with the color black, it's going to conceal whatever that is. So white reveals everything, and if I want to paint with black, then it's going to conceal it. In other words, remove that. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, if I tap the letter B, that'll, that'll uh, present me with a brush. If you don't remember that, you can hover on the left side in the tool palette. When you hover over this one, it'll eventually say brush tool. And in brackets it says B, that means that's the speed key to get there so you don't have to keep looking for it. So B. And then the bracket keys next to the letter P, as in Paul, make my brush bigger or smaller. And then the last thing you should know about a brush is if I go to the top left, up here at the top are always the properties for the tool that you have selected on the left side. Okay, so the only thing I might want to think about is do I want a hard edge brush which looks like this, this very white circle, or the, the soft edge brush which looks feathered and that's it's, why it looks feathered is because it is, it's a feathered brush. Most times I'll use a feathered brush. So I select that and I can make it bigger or smaller. Now, how do I know if I'm painting with black or white? Don't worry, I'm going to review this so it, it'll make sense. Down here at the bottom left of the screen, or not the bottom left, but on the left of the tool palette, you see a black and a white box. If those boxes are not black and white, and they may not be, click the little one above it and it will make them black and white. If white is the foreground and black is the background and you need to paint with black, which is what I've suggested you need to do, you can hit this little arrow, this crooked arrow, and that will rotate these back or flip them back and forth. The speed key is X, so if you tap the letter X, you'll go back and forth between black and white. Okay, so I now have a black brush. Set to, and by the way, the opacity for this brush is at the top up here, and we'll cover this in a minute because it's important. The opacity for the brush, in this case, I'm going to leave at 100% at this moment. We're going to talk about why you'd want to change that opacity too. Okay, so let's see what happens now. Let's just review. I have a layer mask. I've added the layer mask by clicking the washer machine down here. The layer mask is active. I tap the letter B for a brush. I make sure that I have a soft or hard brush by clicking up here in the top left. I set the opacity 100. 
I make sure I have a black brush by looking over here. And now let's see if I paint with this brush in his eyes, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to reveal through just all the way down so that I see his nice, nice sharp eyes. And I can do this on his mouth as well. Notice it's, it's getting rid of some of the tonality there, so you need to be careful with that as well, right? So again, we're teaching techniques here. We're not maybe making perfect photographs. Um, but what I like is bringing back the, the sharpness of the lips and the mustache. So the reason I did it 100% is I wanted to show you how heavy-handed it can be. And oftentimes you would, you would not do that because it is heavy-handed. So, so if I tap the X key, remember that's going to toggle between black and white on the left. I'm going to repaint here and go over this to bring this back and to, to the 100%. So you can, you can add it back in by simply painting with white. Remember, white reveals, black conceals. So what might be a better thing to do is because you don't want it to look so obvious, bring the opacity of the brush, and I'm at the top again, top left. Bring the opacity of your brush down to something like, I don't know, 20%. There's times where I have a brush that's 2 or 3%. It all depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. And now, if I paint with black, and I'm not, I'm playing, painting with white right now, so I'm going to, over here in the bottom left, I'm going to tap the X key to make sure I'm painting with black. Okay, why is that not working? We'll do that. I'm going to paint with black. And now, when I paint, it's only going to be painting 20% of that away. And you'll see that it's hard to see right now, but in the layer mask, I can see two very faint gray marks in there. They're not black. They're gray because it's only painted with 20% of, of the, the value of that brush. And what you need to know is that's cumulative. So if I let go of my, my mouse and I go paint again, now I'm removing 40% of the topaz impression from the eye. Now if I go down to the mouth, same thing. I'm going to paint once and I'm going to remove 20%. Paint on the mustache, 20%. Let go and now paint again and I'm removing 40%. And now we have exactly what I'm looking for. So now the eyes are getting sharper. If I want to make that brush a little smaller, tap the bracket keys next to the letter P. Come into just the eye only, not the eyelids. Paint again. And now I have applied a painterly look to this, but removed part of the painterly look by applying a layer mask, painting with black in that mask, but doing so with a low opacity brush. And the opacity of the brush is adjusted by going up here to the top, because that's where all of the um, properties of the tool that you're selecting on the left side. So we've covered an awful lot there, um, but again, what's nice is they record these webinars so you can go back and, and watch it again. And I'll do this on another picture uh, and cement the idea. But hopefully, hopefully you're starting to have, if you haven't done layers of masks before, hopefully that got an aha out of you because it usually does when I teach this live in a session. People realize, oh my gosh, because just think about this. No matter what effect you're doing, whatever piece of software, you can use this capability. So layers and layer masking is a big deal. And it's what's going to allow you to really take the level of your processing to a, to a whole new level, take your processing to, to a whole new level. Okay. Let me look at the watch. I was afraid of that. I knew that would take a fair amount of time. So let's go to, to the next one, and let's look at some hula girls. And, and in a this, I was just in Hawaii, as um, Nicole said, in the co-leading workshop with Jonathan Kingston and DeWitt and Ricky, uh, National Geographic guys, which was a blast. It was a great workshop. So I want to just blow this up real quickly. Uh, Topaz Denoise is great. Um, you should be aware how great it is, and I've never spent much time on it, but I shot this at a relatively high ISO as it was getting kind of dark, uh, and, but I really and we had already done the shooting of the girls out in the water, and this is in Molokai, uh, Hawaii, uh, yeah, but I knew I'd get some uh, noise, and so I ran it through, and I'll at least do this much. I'm going to go to filter, 
Topaz denoise. I won't let it finish doing its work because that's what takes a lot of time to render. We'd sit here and wait three minutes, actually. Uh, so let's see if we can't bring these girls. Oops, come on. There we go. Okay, so you can see the noise in her back. They've made it really simple. You do have a lot of uh, capability on the right side to bring them some things back, but in general, you'll find really good presets here, and you can go with things like moderate, and you'll notice here's before, after, it's so removing some, but if I go stronger, boom, look at that. Look at the skin now. Uh, is All that noise has been removed. So before, there's the noise, after. Okay, again, I'm not going to hit go or OK because that'll take a long time. It's very uh, math intensive. It'll take forever to process. I'm going to hit cancel. But what I am going to show you is I've already done the work. I put in a topaz layer that has the denoise in it. So there we are. That's how, that's how good it works. It's something you should have in your workflow. And you should do it first if you know you have noise in an image. Do it first in your workflow before you start doing anything that's going to be affecting the image, especially contrast moves, because if you do that, uh, contrast moves will just amplify the noise. So I'm going to just collapse that, and then, so that that's there. I'm going to make a duplicate layer, as my workflow tends to always be. And now what we're going to do is go back, because I can't help it. I, I just love this piece of software, and that's Topaz Clarity. Okay, so a pretty soft scene. I, I love the scene, and I love the water here, and you can see how they've been walking in, and the horizon is very soft, shallow depth of field, all those good things. But I do want to bring back some detail. So, again, you have things and presets over here, but what I've learned is pretty simple moves on the right side. So the question is always, can I do a clarity move in Lightroom or Photoshop? Yeah, absolutely, but there's just one slider to do that with. In a clarity, there's four Right, so you have micro, low, medium, and high. So instead of a, you know, a sledgehammer approach in clarity, it gives you, <clears throat> excuse me, the ability to be a little more gentle. And typically, I'm going over something like this, up around 30, 20s, and then these are coming to the left. That's a common one. How did I learn that? Well, I went and looked at what was going on in some of these presets, and I paid attention to what was going on over here and a vast majority of them tended to have this shape to these. And again, if you haven't been with me before, I have to show this. The histogram and these next sliders are so critical, and it's what sets this apart from any other piece of software right now. Anytime you do contrast moves, you're going to shift your histogram. It's going to move, and you may clip your shadows and highlights. What this program offers is the ability to rein those problems back. And all I do is come to the black level and pull this over. And I, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. I'm sorry. Pull this over. And I'm looking at the left side of the histogram to make sure that comes a, away from the left. And on the right side, I go down to the white slider and pull it to the left a, a little bit. And I bring that back. So now what does it look like before? after I've brought some detail out in those clouds. I don't want a lot in this case. I want it to be gentle. I don't want it to look overdone at all. But even their dresses and the hair, I'm starting to see some detail, and I'm definitely starting to see some detail in the water around their feet. I'm not a big fan of what it's doing in the foreground, but you now are an expert in layers and layer masking, right? So you don't have to worry about that. But before we do that, let's go here. Let's roll open the hue, saturation, and luminosity area. I love these uh, yellow flowers that they had in their hair, but they're not popping the way I'd like them to. So if I go to the saturation slider, let's see what happens with the yellow. I can make those pop really nicely, and it's affecting mostly the yellow. How about their dresses? Well, if I wanted to kick up the green a little bit and make them a little bit you know, vibrant green, I could do that too. And right, and this is the masking I was talking about before that will be added to glow and it will be added to impression. If I open up this mask now and roll this down, here's the mask up here, same, same thinking. White reveals, black conceals. So if I go down and I make my brush size uh, bigger or smaller, I can do that, or the strength of it rather. I can make the size of it bigger or smaller. I can make the hardness of it bigger or smaller. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but if I just get a brush here and I choose hide, there's hide and reveal. So hide is going to be painting with black. I can paint 
some of this. I didn't like the, the oversaturation that was happening in the water as much, so I can remove that. Uh, same thing up here. I can go up to the mask up here, and I can use the same brush, and I can say on the, the, the clarity side of the things, remember this is the clarity portion of this plugin. If I didn't want that clarity to happen in the foreground, I can paint it out right here. Okay? Or I can, if I make that mistake there, I can go to Reveal, and I go to the right side, click Reveal, and now I can paint it back in again. Your choice to do it here, or for the sake of trying to cement the other lesson we just went over, I'm going to leave it like that. So what have I done here? Here's the original. I've added some clarity, and then I've used the hue saturation, um, luminosity, and specifically the saturation to kick up the saturation of the greens and the yellows to make them really jump off the page. Let's uh, go ahead and accept that. It's going to take a little bit of time. Because what I want to be able to do is just cement this idea of layers and layer masks. Even though you have some masking capability in here, uh, it still makes sense to understand that. So here we are again on the right side. Here's the background layer. If I click the eyeball here, we're back to the original photograph. Click it, and there's what I've done in Clarity. So if I wanted to get rid of Clarity in the foreground only on this water, and I want this a little softer, which I do, what do I do? Front loading washing machine, click. That automatically makes my brackets around the white mask. I tap the letter B to get a brush. I make the brush bigger or smaller with the letter next to the letter P with the brackets. I check to make sure I have a soft edge brush up here in the top left. And I do already. And then I need to paint with the color black. I have black here. And if I paint with a low opacity, then I can feather that look in. So I paint once. It makes a light gray mask. If I let go and paint again, it's painting now with 40% because it's cumulative. If I paint again, it's painting with 60%. If I let go, paint again, it's 80% and so on, right? So now I've pretty much removed just that clarity look in the foreground only and left everything else where I want it to be. Okay, I'm going to do that claw. I'm going to do one last little quick thing here just to show you that you can use multiple things. I'm going to go into Topaz Adjust. I've created a duplicate layer there as well. I'm going to make sure to reset this. Remember we spoke about what adaptive exposure is. This is that the relationship of the auto adjust, you know, from zero to 100, as if you will. And then the regions say, do you want to do just kind of the dark darks, or do you want to do some more of the tonalities, and even more and more and more as you move this to the right. So I'm going to bring this all the way to the right in this case, and I'm going to start to gently bring this up. And look what this does to the exposure now. It's bringing back in some of the brightness in their shoulder blades. So let's hit uh, prop. Here's before, after, before, after. So it's I love the little subtle pastel tonalities it's bringing back in. They're probably a little over-processed, quite honestly, on the, the, the lime green is a little more than is necessary. And again, I do these in these presentations so you can actually see it. In, if I was doing this, it would be a, a little more subtle than what I've done here, but you get the idea that we can finish it with Topaz Adjust, go ahead and accept that. So now what do we have? Before we started with this image, we used Topaz Clarity to boost some of those colors, also bring some nice subtle clarity into the, the ripples here and into the sky, and then I decided a little bit of Topaz Adjust to adjust the exposure globally uh, in this case um, and finish it off. So there you go. What do we want to get to next? Well, we want to talk about glow before our, our time's up here. Uh, let me look at the time. I think I have enough time though to go back here. Actually, we're doing okay. So let's just open this one up real quickly. I don't have this open in Photoshop. I didn't know how much time we have. So I've done all my uh, work in Lightroom on this particular photograph. Um, you know, I made, definitely made some adjustments to sliders there, but I always leave the finishing touch uh, to Topaz Clarity because I really like it a lot. It's what I use most of the time for anything like this. So we'll go to Filter, Topaz, and we'll just kind of refresh and, and, and get you squared away with uh, my thoughts on, on this. So let's make sure we're hitting Reset, which we are. Okay. We could go to Landscape, and if we go to Landscape, Here's our uh, various presets, 
and you can click on these presets and it will give you a specific look. Come on, uh oh, I get the impression this is going to kick out of this. Let's hang on for a second. Anytime you see that beach ball of death, it might not be good. Yep, that's what I thought. Let's reopen that. I might have gone uh, too fast. Topaz. Okay, let's try this again. It should be doing those. It might do it one more time. If it does, we'll move on. Well, it's going to do it again. I apologize. Uh, I can see that it did the preset, but it's going to kick us off. Just give me a half a second. I will not use the presets on the left for whatever reason. It's bumping me out today. So I've got to love computers, right? One last time. And this time I will not use the presets. Understand that you can look at your presets uh, normally on any other day. So I'm going to hit the reset here. Okay. Where I'll end up with this, and, and I tend to not use the presets anyway, so that I didn't test that. I apologize. Um, again, I would probably bring this over, and in this case, I'm going to bring it up a little more to the right. Just having played with this image prior, I know that's what I want to do. On low contrast, bring that up into around 30 or 40, and the micro contrast, I'm going to bring these down just a little bit. And I can recognize that it's made it a little bit too dark. Look at the dramatic difference of before and after. But I'm going to pop up my histogram because look what's happened. Just as I expected, by doing some contrast moves, and that's what you're doing, I've blocked up my, my uh, blacks. No problem. Come down to the tone levels here. Bring that over to the right, and let's pull those blacks back into check. There we go. And the whites appear to be okay. We'll just bring them to the left just a little bit. So here's before, after. Look at all the crazy good clarity that we've brought out of this photograph. What a great night that was. Call that fire in the sky. But we're not done. Remember? Hue saturation. I can go to the saturation, and I can bring out some of the green here and pop that green and make it look fluorescent if I want to. There's some yellow up in the hillside here. I can bring out that yellow and bring that up a little bit. It's also going to affect the yellow and orange in the sky if I want to make that what I remember seeing. The luminosity is how the darkness or lightness of that value, so I can uh, bring that up and down. See the hillside? The hillside up there near the sunset. Uh, the green, I can you know, make it brighter or darker as well as being saturated. And so you have lots of control to fine tune the look of the photograph. Clarity rocks. It's, it's fantastic. It's one of the best things that they've come out with, uh, in my mind. All those things are great, but that one just really gets my attention, mainly because of this tone level and being able to recover the issues you're generating by adding contrast. That's always what happens. Okay, let's, let's have some fun, and that's exactly what Glow is. Now, mind you, it's brand new. It's been out for, what, a week? Uh, so I'm still learning this, but I've learned enough that I think I can help you with some cool ideas. <laughs> it's way too much fun. It really is. So let me just scroll to my notes over here and make sure we get some things that make sense. Okay. So, again, on the right side, you have all these presets, the featured ones, the fantasy ones, all these different things. So in this case, let's go to fantasy. And let's come down here, and I have to credit, uh, I can't take many, much credit for this one. I've got to credit Nicole because she showed me this. I would have, would have had no idea, and I think it's a great example. So very affected looks in, in glow, obviously, right? And so if that's what you're after is a very stylized look, the presets are great and help you get there. But if you start to, uh, to play a little bit with blend modes and strengths, so where's that? That's in the bottom left here. If you play with the blend modes and strengths, look what can happen. I can take this and take my blend mode to soft light, and it's completely different. So here's before, here's after. Now it just looks like we've created a metallic-looking car. How cool is that? But look, we could go even further. This Basically, the strength is an opacity slider. Think about them as the same thing. So now I can feather that look, and so now it's not an affected look at all. It's just a stylized look that's pretty darn natural looking, and it really makes that car very metallic looking. All right, so that's Heavy Metal 1. How about Heavy Metal 2? What will that do? Well, let's, let's see. Soft light. 
before, after, a lot more affected look in the wall. So maybe we can pull that strength down a little bit. Now it's not quite as affected. And before, after. If we wanted to um, apply this just to the car to get that metallic look and leave this way up, I'm not going to do it again, but you could go back into Photoshop with a layer and a layer mask and just reveal that and hide everything else that's going on in the background. Pretty cool stuff, just for fun. Watch this. Let's go to neon. These are crazy fun. Look at this. Just crazy or what? That's fun. <laughs> it's just too much like fun. Glowing wires. I adore this one. Really cool. But once again, what happens if we hit a blend mode just for fun? Soft light. Well, we're left with these really cool colors kind of hanging around this thing. And bring it down to here or so, and now we have these edges that have these kind of funky colors before, after. So glow is a blast for really stylized looks and unique effects, if you will, uh, and that's certainly one use for it. But as you start to explore the strength slider and the blend mode, you're going to start to see that there's a lot more opportunities uh, for for various different things. What is this one last one I wanted to show you? Where is it? I think it must be back. Oh, I think it's right here. It's in Fantasy, and it's called Fantasy. How cool is that? Come on. Is that great? And just last but not least, beyond the, the presets, the same thing as the interface for impression. If you want to affect something beyond it or tweak it, just click on the sliders, and now you have the ability to affect the sharpness, what have you, the glow strength, and on and on and on. Th to be candid, this is going to take you a little bit of time. It's not, I mean, other than brightness and contrast and saturation, things like that, you know, glow spread, who the heck knows what that is, right? And electrify, what does that mean? Well, you're going to have to play with it to see what it'll do, and trust me, it's going to be different on every one. Uh, I would encourage you, if you're excited about glow, and you should be, because it's just plain old fun, um, you know, pay attention to the webinars that uh, are going to be posted. I know Nicole's already done a couple, and she's great with blend modes and, and the strength slider. And you'll start to get some tips as to how uh, the each of the sliders on the primary and secondary glow. And then you've got things like a dark versus a light, and that's going to be dif different depending on whether you do it on the primary or the secondary. So uh, trust me, you're going to be able to spend an awful lot of time or, or some people might say waste an awful lot of time uh, playing with this. I saw somebody on on the Facebook page today do a brilliant job with a hula dancer from Hawaii. It was a tremendous uh, job of using this brand new program, and he was kind enough to share some tips, so I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to looking at that. That's all I have. Our time goes speedily by. Hopefully, gosh, I hopefully I get some feedback from my friends who told me to, to go a little more carefully over the layers and layer mask. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, again, if, it, if it's, you're still struggling with that, go ahead and go back and watch the, the recorded session. Um, and I'll put a little plug in for my own website. I do have like a 10-minute version that just covers specifically layers and layer mask. It's free on my website uh, under the video tutorials. And if you want to get to that, you'll see the website come up here in a minute when we turn this back over to Nicole. Thank you so much again, John. Really appreciate you coming back and sharing how uh, you're using the Topaz plugins on your latest images. You're welcome. Happy to be here. And though those who are still there, don't be afraid to reach out on Facebook and ask me questions as well. Happy to answer them there, too. Awesome. Or an email. Either way. Thanks, Nicole. It's always good to be with you. Have, uh, happy holidays to everybody. Happy holidays to you, too. Okay. All right, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming, and we hope you have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, and hopefully you're able to join us on Thursday for our quick tip session on GLOW. Okay. Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.